Hello, my name is Thomas von Bieber at St. Olaf College's Physics 379 Statistical Mechanics course, and today I will be discussing the Chandrasekhar limit and how to arrive at it. Simply speaking, the Chandrasekhar limit is the upper mass limit at which a white dwarf star can hold up against the force of gravity, where if it were to exceed the limit, it would collapse, possibly reigniting itself or collapsing into a neutron star. The primary force which prevents a white dwarf from collapsing is electron degeneracy pressure. This pressure is a consequence of the Pauli exclusion principle, which prevents electrons, which are fermions, from occupying the same quantum state at the same time. Hence, as a star becomes ever more massive, the electrons are compressed, eventually refusing to be compressed more and exerting an outward pressure. There is a simple way to understand the limit and approximate it without getting into too much complexity. First, we examine the star and only two sources of energy, the gravitational energy and the kinetic energy of the particles within. Hence, the total energy is simply just the sum of these two. By assuming that the star is highly degenerate or that all the electrons are in the lowest possible energy states, we can say that this is equivalent to thinking about an electron gas at a temperature zero. Hence, we may find the Fermi momentum and the density of states using momentum space. Then we may find the total number of particles by integrating from momentum zero to the Fermi momentum, and then the total amount of kinetic energy. Now we have an expression for the total amount of energy of the system and can find when this is at an equilibrium. We find that the equilibrium radius is inversely proportional to the cube root of the mass, meaning that the more massive the white dwarf, the smaller it will be. But we can't get a limit out of this. It turns out that the assumption that the particles were non-relativistic is to blame, and we can adjust our result to eliminate this assumption. Here, to find the kinetic energy, we integrate the density of states and the relativistic momentum. Using binomial expansion, we arrive at a total energy. With this result, we notice that if A is less than B, then the energy is unstable and there is no equilibrium. Hence, the requirement is that A must be greater than B, which leads us to the limiting case that A is equal to B. By solving this for the mass, we get that the mass limit is about 1.7 solar masses. It turns out that for finding this mass limit, the name of the game is assumptions. The above derivation made a lot of assumptions, which, while making the math easier, lead to many fallacies. And we will now look at a paper and a lecture by Chandra Sekar from 1983. It is linked in the description below, and I encourage you to look at it as time does not permit a detailed walkthrough and I will only be able to summarize ideas. Previously, the main assumptions that we made were that all energy is kinetic and gravitational, the density of the white dwarf is homogeneous throughout, and the star is a perfect sphere without any atmosphere. During the 20th century, this problem was highly contested and it turned out that the solution was not very simple. The first assumption that we made is that there is only kinetic energy inside. It turns out that there is also radiation pressure, which makes up a fraction of the total pressure, as noted 1 minus beta. This ratio is very important, and by examining ideal gases and the Stefan Boltzmann law, Chandrasekhar found an expression for the pressure of radiation and the pressure of the gas. Here, mu is the mean molecular weight, which in stars is about 1.0, h is the mass of hydrogen atoms, and K is the ever-familiar Boltzmann's constant. And hence, the total pressure can be found as a function of beta. To deal with the density issue, Chandrasekhar made the observation that there were two homogeneous solutions to the density function, namely, that the density throughout is equal to the density at the center, or that the density throughout is equal to the average density of the star. Then, the correct solution must lie somewhere in between these two extremes, and derive this inequality to express it. The idea being that if this inequality is broken, then there are instabilities present and the system is not stable. 
By examining this inequality in respect to previous results, we find this relation between mass and beta. Further numeric and general simplification leads to this relation, or that 1 minus beta is less than or equal to 1 minus beta star. Here, 1 minus beta star is the maximum amount of radiation pressure. This can be found in terms of measurable values, and we can construct a table of these. Since mu is about 1.0, we can see that the maximum amount of radiation pressure for a star the size of the sun is only about 3%. Now we can find the total kinetic energy in a similar fashion as before, but instead of finding an energy relation, we form a pressure relation, again assuming non-relativistic speeds. Here, m is the mass of an electron, n is the number of particles per volume. From there, we can simplify it to form this which is of the form of an Emden polytrope of index 3 halves, where mu e is the mean molecular weight of electrons, which is 2. Here, the standard polytrope form is p equals k times rho to the power of n plus 1 over n. It follows from the theory of polytropes that the constant of the polytrope can be written as such, and we see again that the radius is inversely proportional to the cube root of the mass. But, like before, this is assuming non-relativistic speeds, and a simple correction must be made. When we do account for relativistic velocities, we get the Emden polytrope again, but this time we have an index n equals 3. Again, from the theory of polytropes, we get this relation that the mass limit depends on the constant of the polytrope, or that the mass limit equals 5.76 times 1 over mu e squared. Remembering that mu e is 2, we get that the limiting mass is about 1.44 solar masses. Currently, the accepted value for the mass limit sits at about 1.39 solar masses. By further eliminating ever more assumptions in the math, a more accurate result can be attained. Again, I would encourage you, if you are interested, to go over the paper, as much of what was discussed here skips the nitty-gritty derivations and the mathematics that are involved. I hope you enjoyed and thank you very much for watching.